Howdy, everyone. My name is Jan Franke. Thank you for being here today. I, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Dennis uh, took my speech away from me. So I've been working with this technology for about, oh God, 32 years, right? Um, since the early, or late, late 80s, when GPR was in its embryonic form. And, it, and, it, and it's, I still find it very exciting because it's a technology that taxes the superlatives, right? It's one of the newer geophysical tools. It's by far the most used geophysical tool. I mean, there's tens of thousands of GPR systems around the world used every day. In fact, there's probably one in downtown Vancouver right now looking for pipes in the ground. So we can't say that about any other geophysics. It's the highest resolution. You know, you can use GPR now to detect cancer tumors in the body, a millimeter scale radar. It's very cool stuff. It's also one of the most oversold and full of bullshit technologies <laughs> anywhere in the world. And it's and it goes right back to the 1920s with the first advent of GPR, where claims were being made of kilometers of penetration or the ability to see ore bodies of disseminated sulfide. They're absolutely ludicrous claims. And that continues through to, in fact, this morning. Concurrently with this talk right now, there's a talk by a group in, in Eastern Canada talking about drone GPR right now and its, a, its ability to detect um, uh, First Nations burials, as well as uh, utilities. And we'll talk about those applications in a second. So um, what I do is I design GPR systems, uh, usually custom systems for the mining industry uh, for the most part, as well as for security applications. And I travel around the world and I do lectures. And a lot of my lectures are about managing expectations. Um, in fact, thanks Dennis and Ross for letting me talk early this morning because I'm going to Holland. I'm doing the exact same talk, a similar one anyway, in Holland uh, tomorrow and in Poland on, on Saturday. <laughs> this morning, my mother, I, I stayed with her last night in Vancouver and she says, oh, you're going to Poland. Uh, so will your lecture be in English? I'm like, probably. <laughs> what other language is going to be? I think I'm going to pick up Polish on the flight over. Anyway, so, so this is what I do. Um, so let's talk about drones and GPR. Look, there's some tremendous advantages, as Ron already alluded to, massive aerial coverage. Right away, that's a huge, huge advantage over GPR as we see it today. You know, something that you have to walk around very slowly, take readings every 50 centimeters. What if you could actually travel very quickly and collect all that data instantaneously or, or very quickly with an autonomous drone? Makes sense. GPR is often collected over vegetated terrain. Well, if you can get above vegetation, can we collect data over difficult terrain or more interestingly, dangerous terrain? What if there's hazardous materials? Because GPR is used for a lot of geotechnical studies or for example, unexploded ordnance, right? This is a great application. So there's some tremendous advantages of considering GPR on an off the ground platform, but there's some disadvantages. Firstly, we have the law. Right, I know there's somebody here from, um, from the federal government. So in Canada, we have something called RSS 220. It's uh, legislation by Industry Canada that says that any GPR or wall penetrating radar or ground penetrator must be conducted within one meter of the ground or I suppose the wall. There's some reasons for that, one meter. Now, this is not unique to us in Canada. Certainly, we copied it from the Americans. The Europeans copied it as well. The Australians have similar legislation. So for a lot of Western countries, there is this limitation of keeping a radar one meter off the ground. Okay, so there's that problem. And the second problem that nobody considers is the physics. It just doesn't work. This is not a solution for, you know, just lifting up a radar off the ground changes the physics of how the radiation gets into the ground in the first place. And, and let's talk about that. So this is not a new idea at all. In fact, at all. <laughs> in fact, GPR was in, invented, discovered accidentally, quite by accident in the late 1940s and early 1950s by originally Lancaster bombers that were being shuttled from Prestwick in, uh, in Scotland across the Greenland ice cap at night and into Gander in Newfoundland. And what happened, as I'm sure many of you know the story, they were using the original radar altimetry. So essentially it was a, a forward pointing radar that they pointed down into the ground to get altimetry, right? So they know how high they are above the ground. And the first squadron that, that crossed the Greenland ice cap at night ended up in the ice cap, they crashed. Why was that? Because the radar turned out to be imaging the bedrock, which is, oh, about three kilometers below the actual ice level. So, so that was a loss of the squadron, and that was a terrible thing for aviation. But of course, the geologists went, hey, wait a minute, we can actually use this. And, and literally, the first GPR surveys from one of these concepts was taking a radar system from a Lancaster bomber out to Antarctica, and the British Antarctic Survey surveyed a, a glacier using, essentially, a radar from a bomber. 
So we've known that GPR works from the air for a long, long time. Uh, that's nothing new. And in fact, the, 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 the embryonic form of commercial radars was in the late 1960s with the Apollo 17 project, which had the, uh, the, the surface, the lunar sounder experiment that had penetration to a kilometer through the lunar, the, the lunar surface. Now, of course, a kilometer, that's amazing, particularly from something that's orbiting the moon. Um, and that's of course possible because it's a very low dielectric and the resistivity is rather high on the moon. So it's an absolutely perfect environment for, for radar. And that's some of the original pictures from the 1960s. And that depth range is about one kilometer down to uh, those channel deposits. Um, and then in the 70s and 80s, we had people lifting large, powerful radar systems over glaciers to, to map glaciers for glaciology. And that works very, very well. Um, a Chilean university has invented their own system. Argentina Argentina's done it. All over Switzerland, this is a fairly common tool for uh, radio glaciology. Um, here's another way of deploying it on an aircraft. So as a long drogue sort of uh, drag system that but flies behind the, uh, the aircraft. And at low frequencies, that's about 50 megahertz, you'll get multiple, well, certainly over a kilometer of penetration at 50 megahertz. Great environments. Now let's talk about the physics of this. So firstly, we have energy loss. We all know it's you know, related to one over R. So there's energy loss. The further up we go, the more energy we're losing. But the other problem is this whole concept of geometric spreading. And, and when it comes to the Fresnel zone, so when the radar antenna is on the dielectric, for the most part, let's say we get about 70% of the energy goes into the dielectric group of the ground and 30% escapes upward. There's nothing we can do about that. But if you start decoupling the antenna from the dielectric, that is lifting it about mm, one eighth of a wavelength. So what does that mean? Well, one eighth of a wavelength, 100 megahertz is about three meters. So, you know, maybe above 50 centimeters off the ground. What happens is you're decoupled and you get 50-50, right? It's an omnidirectional antenna for the most part. So 50% is going up and only 50% is going down. So already I've lost something there. The next problem is this whole concept of the radiation of the Fresnel zone, it widens up, the, the velocity changes. So now, instead of having a reasonably focused beam when I'm on the ground, my beam pattern's much wider. So I'm getting less energy going downwards. I have a wider beam pattern. That's two problems right there. And then the next problem is the actual reflectivity of the ground in the first place. And that is related to dielectric permittivity, which is water content for the most part, right? So if I was surveying over water, which is a dielectric, the highest we have is 81, right? Going from air to water, I'm losing 80% of my energy at that water contact. Well, shit, that's not gonna work very well, is it? Unless I was hovering right over the water in the first place. So, okay, that's interesting. And I can do that because water's flat. So maybe that's possible. But as you can see, when you start looking at ice and snow, hey, wait a minute, I'm only losing seven, you know, 10%. That's actually a feasible environment. So for most ground materials, we're losing at least 50% of energy right at that ground surface. Ain't nothing we can do about that unless we're within one eighth of a wavelength, which is, as I say, well under one meter. So this one meter legislation in, in North America actually bodes well for the physics uh, uh, as well as the legislation, right? So we do wanna keep our radar antennas as low as possible. A, not to get a $10,000 fine from Industry Canada and B, to actually get some penetration to the ground in the first place. So, what does that mean if you actually lift it off the ground and you break the law? Well, here's an example of radar I just built last week. And, and this is actually done in Sweden. So this is a hundred megahertz system. Uh, I mean, it's seeing down about three meters. And if it's dragged on the ground, we actually see, mm, let me not blind myself. We actually see some, some horizons here. This is not real. That is upgoing energy that's bouncing off a house that's nearby, right? So we want to ignore those um, those reflections here. Now, if I take that and move it one and a half meters off the ground, oops, breaking law in Sweden, we get nothing and all of that energy is just airway reflection from trees, from the fence, from the people, from the cars, from the plate of grass. So keeping it very low to the ground is not only, <laughs> not only good for the law, but it's the only way to really do it. There's other issues. We're carrying this thing potentially with a, with a device that has all sorts of telemetry systems. It has uh, little motors that have their own RF fields around them. 
And the telemetry systems, for example, can be and generally are in, in the ISM bands, which happens to be quite often the, the bands that we operate in. So now we have a whole bunch of interference because radar by its very definition is ultra wide band, right? So if you have a 500 megahertz antenna, we're actually interested in bandwidth from 250 up to 750 megahertz. And quite often in North America, we'll be using, oh, a 433 or a 780 megahertz telemetry system. Oh shit. That's what happens. You get a huge amount of interference. Hmm. Well, that's another problem that we have to get around too, right? So when I when I proposed this talk, the organizers were like, "Oh, we don't want to be too negative, right?" At the start of the day, but physics is physics. What can you do? So so let's. So I already talked about the legal issues. Um, uh, the one of the compromises is is that uh, you know. Well, let's, let's go back in history a little bit. So back in the 1990s, the US government, the FCC and the FAA specifically, Federal Aviation Guys said, GPR illegal, we can't do it. It's too wideband, it could interfere with aviation, it could interfere with radio uh, transmissions. It's a security issue, no GPR. And the GPR industry went, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. No, no, you can't do that. And there was about four years and, and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars spent lobbying the US FCC and the FAA to allow GPR in very specific environments. But it also meant no unshielded antennas in North America. Uh, you have to keep it within one meter of the ground and they begrudgingly let the industry kind of get a hall pass in a way. And now we have guys all over the United States and particularly here in Canada that are trying to lift unshielded antennas off the ground well over one meter. And, you know, yes, they're not doing it outside Vancouver airport perhaps, but it really runs some risks. So we're really playing double jeopardy here, right? We have a technology that was barely legal in the first place and just squeaked by 22 years ago. And we have a technology that's legislated to say, no, you gotta be within one meter and people are doing whatever distance they want and advertising it. Um, we're running some serious risks of getting things banned. And that impacts not just GPR, but the entire geophysics industry. So it's something to be aware of. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of these caveats. Um, how does this, how do we make this work? Well, you got to keep it within one meter, within the law and within the physics. Um, we have to know where we are. And there's some, there's some physics we won't get into about knowing the exact height above the terrain, because that is important in processing. So you use your radar altimetry, like uh, Ron suggested, and you need to track this thing accurately with 3D grids. So we're good. How are we doing on time? Great. So I'm going to tell you that was all the negative stuff. So let's let's talk about areas that it does work well. And yeah, bathymetry actually does work well. If you can get the drone down below, say, 50 centimeters off the water surface, and there are companies now that make integrated drone solutions with radars on board, and there are a company in Latvia that can hover within a couple of centimeters of, uh, of, of a train and can do train falling very well. And you get some amazing data if you can get close enough to the water surface. So drone bathymetry makes sense. And there's lots of applications, be it tailing ponds, be it you know, areas that are inaccessible, even whitewater rapids can be surveyed using GPR that way, right? So fairly, fairly good application. Another one, of course, is glaciology. We've already talked about that. It's always worked well. It's brilliant data down you know, dozens of meters, if not hundreds of meters. The application that, that people like to get excited about is geotechnical or just civil infrastructure uh, applications. So finding pipes in the ground or cables in the ground. And therein lies some problems, right? Because we lose that resolution because of that geometric spreading and that, that amount of um, uh, bouncing off the surface. There are some applications, yeah, I've never seen really convincing data that says this is the next step to, uh, to GPR instead of moving a, a shopping cart bower, you know, a, a lawnmower back and forth across a site. So yeah, there's a potential there. Uh, I've been working with the Korean, South Korean army, um, developing radars for unexploded ordnance along the 30th parallel for obvious reasons that any data is better than no data at all. Um, but even there, the penetration is horrible. At best, we're seeing very large landmines, like tank sized landmines um, at 50 centimeters, right? It's high clay content. We're not getting a lot of penetration. But their argument is hey, we can't put a soldier there. This is inaccessible ground. If we can fly anything, get any data, it's better than nothing. Fair enough. That makes sense. Um, so, what do we do about this? Well, I told you about this geometric spreading problem, right? Any, any antennas that we use today, we're, we're just gonna have this massive beam path. But do we have to do that? Why do you use the antennas that shape? Well, we use that because that's just what's used on the ground. But what if we had directional antennas? And there are very simple and, and clever 
directional antenna designs. These are a couple of my drones that are not my drones, but my radars that I've developed. And, uh, you know, Vivaldi antennas, for example, have a tremendous amount of directionality. They look a little weird and they are large planes, but they direct, you know, 80% of the energy downwards. Well, that kind of gets away and in a fairly focused way as well. So that sort of gets away uh, from the geometric spreading issue. So that works down to about 500 megahertz. Unfortunately, for deeper applications, the size would be well over a movie poster. So it's not really practical to carry that. But directional antennas are one way of, of solving the problem. Oh, can I, uh, hold on, let me, this is a video. So the other thing that we've been working with uh, companies in, in Germany is low flying dirigibles. And yeah, it's not very practical in, uh, in high wind environments, but they're highly maneuverable and they're very, very accurate in positioning and they can hover for, these things go for 12 hours on one battery. So uh, doing, doing surveys with dirigibles uh, seems to work very well in certain environments as well. So let's talk about the future because um, everybody's here to talk about what's coming up next. So uh, Jim, uh, many of you know Jim McNay. Uh, Jim and I have been working for the last six, seven years on a Myra project sponsored by the mining industry um, to develop the next generation GPR for very deep penetration. And it's going away from magnetic, uh, sorry, electric field antennas and using magnetic antennas. And some of the advantages to that have applications for drones because magnetic antennas aren't relevant, uh, the, the frequency of the antenna is not relevant related to the, the size of the antenna, right? So, so for a five megahertz or even two megahertz antenna, which we're developing, it's 30 centimeter long rod, that's it. So if you have something that's 30 centimeters and two or five megahertz or even below one megahertz, and it's already getting into that EM, you know, dispersive, non-dispersive field, um, so it's kind of a hybrid EM GPR system. If you have something that's 30 centimeters, well, you could mount that on a drone. And there's another advantage. Remember the one eighth of the wavelength? Well, the wavelength of these things are massive. So you could fly 50 meters off the ground, right? Aside from the legal issues, but you could do that theoretically and still not lose much in the way of penetration. And the final thing is that one of the issues is that we, you know, we're using electric field antennas, there's a massive electric field difference between the air and the ground. Whereas with magnetic field, there isn't as much of a difference. So we're getting more and more magnetic energy into the ground with these systems. So we're testing these right now. Uh, it's, it's actually for the, the moon to Mars mission. So we're launching this April next year. Uh, we're gonna have uh, one of my radars on the moon, hopefully if it doesn't blow up. Uh, and, and that's for the Artemis mission to, um, to look for um, basalt tunnels um, for human habitation on the moon. But it's being tested right now in WA in Western Australia at uh, 10 meter flight height. And we're getting great penetration down to hundred meters. So there are potentials of low frequency radars um, Again, not within one meter of the ground, but aside from that little legal issue, uh, there's, there's some very good potential there. There's some other interesting applications that, that, uh, well, that I'm working on right now. One has been uh, concrete structure inspections. So traditionally, we do GPR by, by using a you know, handheld palm sort of thing going up and down a wall. Well, one of the applications is can we make a very lightweight, high frequency radar with a stinger on it that can do the wall scanning for you? And then you can have access to anything without scaffolding and, or rappelling down a, a tall structure. Great. Another application, particularly in the city of Toronto, who's been talking about this is bridges. As we know, our infrastructure is not doing very well these days and being able to scan the underside of bridges for not just rebar corrosion or concrete cancer, but just even, they don't even know the, the rebar spacing for, for retrofitting or upgrades. Some of those plans are lost and they don't even know that. So being able to get a radar up there without disrupting traffic, with all the safety issues of having a man on a, uh, on a cherry picker, there's huge advantages of that. So neat application. Another one is, um, is uh, with, with our friends to the south, they are interested in placing a uh, very lightweight GPR on a drone that could be placed on top of a, a, settle, a, a house, for example, or a building, obviously not with a metal roof. And, and with one or two of these being able to detect uh, human movement uh, or in fact respiration. So there's already um, security applications for wall penetrating radar that can detect where a person is in, in a room, tell if you're standing or, or laying down or sitting, as well as if you're uh, breathing or not, just based on, on the, the, the change in the wavelength of, the, um, of, of your chest. So doing the same sort of thing for a, a security application, you can imagine in certain 
countries, I don't know why that looks Middle Eastern, but whatever, in certain countries, being able to identify where and how many individuals are in a house, for example, might be useful if you're about to breach into that, that residence and, and do something there. So there's uh, some very interesting applications for, for um, Homeland Security guys. And on a similar note, for earthquakes or collapsed structures, having a GPR that can land and detect uh, movement or indeed a respiration, uh, that's been done for a while now. There's actually uh, sensors and software makes one specifically for earthquakes. Um, can we miniaturize that? And instead of having a human walk out onto the, uh, you know, the collapse range, which is unstable, can we put that there with a drone and just shut the drone down, keep everything quiet and seeing if there's any change in the, in the radar reflections? So some really neat applications there. So conclusions and oh, one minute over. So huge ad advantages in very specific limited environments, right? It is, it's being oversold right now. It does work, but it needs to be either, you know, hyper arid sand or glaciers or ice or snow. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we need to watch the, the legal limitations on this because we're on pretty shaky ground as it is with GPR. So we definitely don't want to, um, you know, incur any issues. Guys, thanks so much for, for listening to me. Does anybody have any questions? Sounds Thank good. you, Jan. Yeah. I, I think this is, a, he's very kind of supportive what I was saying about innovation. He, what he's doing is really an example of where we're, what we're going to see in the years to come about how you're rethinking the sensors, about how you're rethinking the, the uh, attachment to the drone, you're really actually getting a drone that is really purpose-built for the application. Sure. That's where we're going. So I'm gonna open it up. Do you have, do you have any questions to, to share with Jan? Uh-oh, uh-oh, the prof. Be happy to. Thank you, that was an excellent talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, with GPR, so I'm a little less familiar with the antenna systems. What's the basic ideas with a magnetic antenna? Yeah, what is magnetic? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question for Jim. I just do the electronics behind it. But essentially, what's that? It's not. It's actually using a new 3D printed nano something. And it's, it's tiny little um, ferrite. Well, I mean, they're, they're ferrite slivers that, that are, you know, tiny, tiny things. And if they actually break apart, you slice your finger off. Um, and they, I, I don't understand how it's made, but it's, it's, it's from a military application and it's only been available in the last six years. It's made in California. Uh, essentially what he's doing is he's inducing a large magnetic field that's radiating out uh, from in, in the H field instead of the E field. So they are, well, B field, I should say. So they are primarily a B field antenna. Now that's being tried before with GPR in loops indeed, yep. Um, loops tend to be okay, but they're very narrow band. This one's actually quite wide band. Uh, the problem is it's too low frequency. So it's now well past the GPR, um, uh, you know, the plateau, it's fallen off and now it's into a dispersive wavelength, right? Uh, so now it's, we're looking at a hybrid EM uh, GPR tool that uh, it's been tested and it works right now. It's now it's the mechanics of how do we actually carry this thing and how do we move it around? Um, but there's, there's lots of that we've published on it now uh, as part of the Amira project. So if, Lindsay, if you want to, I'll, I'll send you papers on it. Yeah. Sorry, that wasn't a very good answer because I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Any other Thanks questions? Honest. For what? Right. That's that's so he asked what frequency range frequency is range. the yeah. yeah, or frequency range. So we're looking at about 300 kilohertz up to well, it's supposed to be 30, let's say 10 megahertz. So very, very long wavelengths. And as I said, it's just falling off the GPR plateau into a dispersive uh, waveform. So there's a little bit of inversion that needs to, to go on there. It's not a simple GPR equation, uh, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll sort of split up the spectrum. And what we're doing right now is I'm only interested in the stuff that's in the, in the non-dispersive range. So from three megahertz up to about 10 or 12 um, is what I'm looking at right now. And then the guys at RMIT are looking at the EM side because I don't even know what EM stands for. Um, okay. Yeah. Excellent question. <laughs>